Okay, so we are live on YouTube and we're streaming. So today is the November 30th, 2022 uh, Municipal Planning Commission meeting. Um, as the secretary, I'm calling the meeting to order at 9.02 a.m. Um, our next uh, item on the agenda is to appoint the chairperson for the 2023 term uh, for MPC. So I'm calling for nominations for chair. I see one nomination from Kevin Hebb. Are there any other nominations? Oh, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, I'd like to nominate Terry as chair. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I have to call for nominations three times. Um, so calling the first time, second, and third. Terry, do you accept this nomination? Yes. Thank you. Um, and then we'll just need a vote for chairperson, or all of you to vote that Terry is chair. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, and next we need to make an appointment for vice chairperson. So I need a nomination for vice chair. Perfect, thank you, Terry. Um, so I need to call for nominations three times. So I'm calling a sec first, second, and third. Seeing no further nominations. Andreas, do you accept this nomination as vice chair? Perfect, thank you. And then I'll just need um, a vote, a motion. Thank you. Um, and then the next item on the agenda is to select the dates for the 2023 um, term. Um, so in the past, um, MPC has um, typically done the th uh, third Wednesday of each month. However, administration is requesting that we move that to the last Wednesday of each month. Um, it just corresponds better with um, council packages, um, and it's just uh, it 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 just cor like it's just coordinating better with um, administration. So You'll just need to turn on your mics. So in the last time we talked about changing the dates, it was mostly with council members who had an issue with the common law there. Yeah, so at the October 11th, 2022 organization meeting, um, there was a motion passed um, by resolution that um, uh, committees could schedule their own uh, meetings. So I don't see there being any issues. Um, so it's up to MPC to decide if they wish to go um, with the staff recommendation, which is to accept that meetings be scheduled for the last Wednesday of each month or you can go with the third Wednesday of each month, which has been done historically. Um, and there's two uh, motions there for you to select from. As council, I'll, um, it would take off um, a, a, double, a double day because we had we have our council, whatever the new name of that committee is now. Used to be Finance Neck. Uh, we just changed it yesterday. Sorry. Um, we have it on Tuesday and MPC Wednesday. So this would also be beneficial for the two council members. Oh, so y are you making a motion? Yes, I'll make the motion that okay. we move it to the last Wednesday of the month. Perfect. And then uh, we just need a vote. Perfect, thank you. And I'll pass, uh, pass this on to Terry as chair to continue the agenda. Thanks, Terry. Um, so who's taking notes today? Okay, thanks, Terry. Uh, just before we get into the rest of the agenda, um, briefly, I guess <coughs> you guys are from Kells. It's like, uh, is anybody else coming today that you know? So uh, the way it will go is we've got a few things to do on the agenda, then we'll get to the applications, and when we get there, um, I'll ask you to make some selections then. Um, administration will have, uh, <coughs> will review the, the application and the recommendations, and then uh, we, uh, councilors may, or commissioners may have questions of uh, administration, and then they'll come back to you. Um, So we won't have, it doesn't look like we'll have any members of the public. So that should do it. So let's, uh, let's go to um, item D, the agenda today. Any uh, changes? If not, we'll move them 
motion? Okay. I'll maintain the motion to approve. All in favor? Pass. Okay. Uh, the minutes of October 19th. Any, any changes? Yeah, I'll make the motion for the minutes. Okay, all in favor? Okay. We have uh, no business from the minute, rising from the minutes. So we'll get right to the application. So E1. Uh, gentlemen, if you'd like to have a seat, please. Who's presenting? Is Mr. Johnson going to do this one? Are you? Okay. Application number 8121. Location is Lot 9, Lot 9, Plan 1412321. Ocean Salt Works, 1824 Lane 9, W5N, Part 25 Lane 7, Bio Lebanon Spas. District Designers Industrial District, Proposed Developments, Communication Tower and Facility, Applica Applicant's Information. The applicant is an Iran Solution LP, the last member of the Tower Communication team. They were directly related from David M. Lerner, and that is Oscar Holdings. The subject site is located on the north side of Lansing Valley Road within the Lansing Valley Industrial Association. The reason why this application is not considered inclusive is because communication towers and facilities are listed as discretionary use within the Annex Industrial District. Proposed development requirements, the application is for the construction of a telecommunication tower and facility con consisting of a 35 meter monopole wireless telecommunication with um, the lightning rod at the top that will make it 36.5 meter. And it would have uh, flush mounted antennas as well as the 2.438 meter by 3.048 meter structure. Equipment, there will be an equipment shelter where supporting equipment is stored and operated. The shelter protects, is meant to protect various communication and ele electrical equipment connections to and from the site and to equipment on the tower. Okay, in the land use bylaw, there is no specific maximum height for a communication tower and facility. The, <coughs> require, the, um, speci the specification is just to keep it as low as possible. The proposed development exceeds the minimum required setback, so uh, required setback permit for this um, proposed um, development. The proposed facility will be located within a 12 meter by 12 meter fenced compound leased from the property owner that I've already mentioned. Access to the compound would be via a 10 meter wide access right of way over the subject property from Limestone Valley Road. Regarding fencing, Overall height will be equal or less than 2.2 meter, and that will be in compliance with um, section 19.6.5 of the land use bylaw. There is a section in the bylaw that talks about um, landscaping. Applicants had already indicated landscaping is not intended for this um, project. The applicant had, has indicated that the tower will be painted black to decrease visual contrast when viewed from a distance and to allow the tower to blend better with the surrounding 
forested landscape. They further indicated that further decrease in the proposed heights would have a detrimental impact on the ability to enhance wireless service in the area. As per section 4.5.4 of the land use bylaw, consideration must be given to minimize the risks, risk to birds. In their consultation summary, the applicant has indicated that the proposed tower will not pose a significant risk to mig migratory birds because the tower is re relatively low in height and does not require guy wires and does not require aeronautic lighting. Consistent with section 4.5, conditions of approval have been recommended that I would advocate for allowing qualified professionals to undertake research on the site, prohibit signage other than warning signage on the facility and require immediate removal of this facility when it becomes obsolete. So this will be um, in, in accordance with um, the provisions in the land use bylaw. Section 4.2.7 of the land use bylaw outlines the application requirement for communication towers and facilities. Subsection 42.7.1 states in part that the municipal district of Bigon recogni recognizes that Industry Canada is the regulating body and approving authority for the placement of radio communication facilities, but that it has been Industry Canada's practice to work with municipal governments to ensure that the local concerns are addressed in the approval process. To this end, the municipal district of Vigon will use its established development permitting system as set out in this um, land use bylaw, which is what we use to um, prepare this application to, uh, for um, recommendation for decision today before the committee. Certain elements of the development must be addressed through Industry Canada's um, approval process, and that we have uh, gone through some of those, and that is including Transport Canada's color which I had already mentioned, and lighting requirements for aeronautical safety, Health Canada's guidelines with respect to exposure to radio frequencies, environmental assessment that comply with the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, and infrastructure sharing and co-location of antenna. All, the, all of those have been uh, addressed during the application process. As per section 42.7.3 of the land use bylaw, public con consultation is required. So the applicant, they, conduct, um, they had the public consultation in October 2021, and a newspaper notice was placed in the Rocky Mountain Outlook. A notification package was mailed to 15 landowners within um, 114 meters. For the public consultation, um, 47 responses were received. 41 were in opposition, five in support, and one was unsure. Neighbor notification, nothing was received as far as neighbor, uh, neighbor notification is concerned. And um, the applicants did mention that they explored the option of co-location, which is a requirement in the land use bylaw, and um, they were not able to, to get a suitable site to share facilities, so that would be why they are requesting this. The property, over to, and the applicants also indicated that they have uh, received approval from Rivers Bend Development Inc. So, to be able to move ahead with this um, project. Relevant reports and documents as per section 42.7.4 of the land use bylaw, a development impact assessment may be required, which they have already done, and um, was, um, we received a third party comment as well. So the BIA was prepared by Headmaster Environmental Strategies Inc. for, the, for land solutions, and re 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 it was reviewed by the MD recommended third party um, Company, CIMA. So the DIA concluded that from an environmental standpoint, this is an ideal location for a telecommunications tower, given that the area is already disturbed. It does not have any adverse environmental impacts to the hydrology within the general area and does not contain any critical wildlife habitats. The DIA also outlines mitigation measures required to minimize the disturbance of the proposed tower construction and operation, including controlling 
weight species as outlined in the weight control, all of those will be um, conditions that will be added in the development permits to make sure that um, those um, measures are taken care of. So, additionally, the DI notes that since the area's potential archaeological resources, approval under the Historical Resources Act is required. So, same with um, the previous one that would be um, noted in the development permit. The applicant submitted a geotechnical report from uh, P. Machibra, Machibroda Engineering Limited, dated January 18, 2022. The report describes subsurface soil conditions at the site and provides design recommendations. A condition of approval will also be included in the EP. Both internal and external referrals were completed. Operations department had no comment on the application. B, um, B and A planning group responded on behalf of Transport Canada with no comment or concerns with the proposed development. Alberta Transportation noted that the proposed development falls within the permit area of a provincial highway as outlined in the Highway Development and Protection Act regulation and that the proposed development will not cause any concern or for ongoing operation or future highway expansion and as such issued an exemption from permit requirements pursuant to section 25 of the Highways Development and Protection Regulation. The applicant has also requested that um, the MD provides a, um, a concurrence letter indicating if this um, approval, if the, um, the file is approved, they would uh, want a uh, concurrence letter. So that would be required. And then now. For staff recommendation that the Municipal Planning Commission approve the development permit application number 8121 for a 36.5 telecommunications facility as per the application as subject to some of the conditions I have here. I don't know if you would want me to go over the conditions. It's already included in the package. Would you want me to do that, please? Sure, I think we're okay. Thanks, Hassan. Thank you. Uh, questions for Hassan? No. Um, would you guys have something you'd like to present or, or could you just want to answer questions? You will just have to use your microphone. We can hear you. It's the people uh, online that can't. Check. Good morning, my name is James McQuarkadale. I'm with Land Solutions, uh, presenting on behalf of TELUS Communications. I'm joined by my client and colleague, Dan Johnson from TELUS. Uh, this morning, we'd like to present a, a brief uh, a presentation to you. Uh, it should take approximately 10 minutes. Um, as presented by uh, administration, uh, TELUS is proposing a 36.5 meter monopole in the hamlet of uh, Dead Man's Flats. The need for this particular facility is presented by a desire to improve uh, access to wireless connectivity within the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats along the Highway 1 corridor and also along the Highway 1A corridor on the no north side of the Bow River. Uh, additionally, this will improve access to emergency services not only in these areas, but also in recreational areas adjacent to the community. 
It will also address network deficiencies that were first identified in 2017. The site selection process has been quite thorough and it's lasted quite a long time. Uh, some of the factors that were considered are existing and future usage patterns, the local terrain, interaction with existing antenna systems, line of sight requirements, land availability, access to the site itself, uh, access to electricity, and access to fiber for the data backhaul service. Uh, land Solutions was given a 500 meter radius search area, which did center on the hamlet, uh, specifically in the industrial area. There are a limited number of locations that meet the land use bylaw requirements in the area, and we do feel that the most suitable option was within the industrial park. As previously mentioned by administration, there were no fe uh, feasible co-location options. So there are no existing towers that we could mount the equipment on. As we all know, uh, wireless trends are quite profound. Uh, my colleague Dan was mentioning yesterday that year over year, data traffic is increasing at an exponential rate of 30% per year. This is driving the need for more antennas in order to serve these clients, both commercial, residential, individuals, and businesses. The location that's being proposed is identified by the green star on the map that you can see right now. It is within the industrial park, within the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats. And I think the need for this facility is very well il illustrated when we look at the coverage maps. You can see that in its present state, what we have right now is a vast area which is at the low end of the coverage spectrum. You can see the scale in the lower right corner of this screen. The colors gray, pink, and blue are indicative of low coverage or um, ineffective coverage in some cases. In the event that the application is improved, uh, is Hello? In the event that the application is approved, uh, you'll see the coverage not only within Dead Man's Flats, but also along the Highway 1 corridor and the Highway 1A corridor is enhanced to the top end or the red zone of the spectrum. The administrative colleague uh, already presented numerous uh, items within the policy considerations, but it should be noted that the MD of Bighorn's land use bylaw, section 42.7, does clearly indicate that Innovation, Science, and Economic Development Canada, or ISED, is the default public consultation process that we need to follow. Um, land Solutions has followed uh, guideline CPC 2 0 0 3. However, we do require a development permit application, uh, which is what brings us here today. I said uh, policy CPC 2-0-03 is the sole approving authority when it comes to radio communications towers. The approval process includes aeronautical safety, lighting and marking, Health Canada safety guidelines, environmental legislation, and the need to consider co-location opportunities. The development permit application and public consultation has been completed uh, according to ISET's policies. We have completed a development impact assessment as requested, and as previously indicated, there were no negative impacts identified within that DIA. Um, additionally, the geotechnical investigation was completed. There are no concerns, and TELUS has every intention to comply with the recommendations within that geotechnical investigation. The design of the structure, as you know, or may not know, uh, has been amended from what was originally proposed. Um, the design was approved by the area developer, and that includes not only the structure type being a monopole with flush-mounted antennas, uh, but also with the color that was selected by the area developer. A phase one environmental site assessment was previously completed by the area developer uh, prior to the industrial land being developed. As you can see, the notification area for this facility uh, did not impact numerous parcels of land outside of the industrial area. However, as required within ISET's policy, uh, multiple newspaper notices were published in the Rock Mountain Outlook, and that did garner significant public feedback. 
As previously indicated, we did receive 47 letters regarding this program. Five letters were in support, 41 letters raised concerns about the program, and one letter was neutral. The biggest item of concern that was noted during the consultation process was the structure type. This is the structure that was originally proposed. It was a lattice tower, or um, a lattice tower with antennas mounted in, in a flower design, so not flush to the structure. We received significant feedback on that. And on the basis of public feedback, TELUS has agreed to uh, install a flush or a monopole structure with flush mounted antennas. This is an actual photo rendering of what the tower will look like from within the, uh, the industrial park itself. Some of the uh, most notable feedback, or actually a summary of the feedback that we received, um, with respect to the location, it was identified that it is a suitable industrial land use. It provided a buffer from nearby residences and from environmentally significant lands. And it's also centrally located in order to meet TELUS's needs. Uh, we received feedback regarding the aesthetics. Um, TELUS did revise the tower design, as previously mentioned, and uh, worked very closely with the area developer whose approval was required by the municipal district. Aeronautical safety was raised as an issue. Transport Canada and Nav Canada have indicated that they have no objections to the tower and that there's no need for aeronautical lighting on this tower, so there won't be any flashing beacons on the tower. Health and safety was raised as a concern. Uh, the facility must comply with Health Canada's safety code limits, uh, which is enforced by ICED. Um, ICED does consider health and safety as an item of feedback, but not a, a reason for them to disallow the development of a tower. And the reason being that any radio communications tower must comply with Health Canada's safety code six limits. Uh, property value was raised as an issue. Um, again, I said does not consider property value to be a reasonable and relevant concern to disallow the construction of a tower. Um, there's anecdotal evidence on both sides of the property value impact. Um, and, and as such, I said will not entertain that as a reason to disallow a tower. Environment and wildlife. Uh, the proposal as assessed in the event, um, Developmental impact assessment indicated that there will not be a negative impact on the environment. And finally, municipal policy and process was raised as a concern. Uh, the process was clarified so that the public better understood the applicable federal and local policies. Um, the public was also notified and encouraged to participate in the process. The socio uh, socioeconomic impacts and the next steps. Um, the benefits uh, of this program, um, the enhanced wireless voice and internet service for the residents, businesses, and visitors. Right now, the Hamlet, the Highway 1 corridor, and the Highway 1A corridor are all in a bit of a gray zone for coverage right now. TELUS wants to change that. Um, it will also provide improved access to emergency services, not only in the community itself, but in the uh, adjacent recreational areas. It provides additional choice for reliable and fast home and business internet service. Now, <clears throat> uh, this would be related to those who choose to connect to the internet using their mobile devices. And finally, it, the importance of supporting the infrastructure required to provide essential services can't be understated. Uh, at present, there is no tower within the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats, and TELUS would like to improve that service. The next steps that we are seeking are the approval of the development permit and the issuance of a concurrence letter so that we can submit uh, that to innovate, uh, pardon me, Industry, Science and Economic Development Canada. That concludes the presentation. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions or discussion? Okay, some ways I read about the possibility of okaying biologists to do a bird study on impact on the uh, tree birds and animals in, in the area. Is there anything planned in that area as just an ongoing 
case study to make sure that we are not killing birds. I realize you've removed the guide wires, which is one of the main areas for birds who are destroyed. Yeah, so just is there a study planned or is there some kind of periodic yeah, information gathering just so we know what actually happened? Through the chair. Um, the, the facility itself must comply with the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. So at present, there are no actual studies planned. However, TELUS has acknowledged that there may be a desire to conduct studies in the future, and they are willing, in accordance with the conditions of the development permit, to provide access to the facility to conduct those studies. Okay, thank you. Uh, just further to that, if there's a, if there's a conflict in the documents, and just wanted to question the DIA, in the conclusion of the, of the DIA, uh, there's a statement that mitigation, that this is talking about migratory birds, mitigation measures are required. Um, in your report, um, you say that there's a better risk and nothing is going to be done. Um, the uh, the um, conditions of the of the uh, approval um, require you to meet the conditions of the DIA. So I, I'm kind of not sure where you're going with that. Mr. Chair, the uh, noted and the condition of the permit is paramount and any conditions including compliance with the dia would be adhered to by telus um so just out of curiosity then um is there anything planned for for mit uh, mitigation measures for the uh, migratory birds i don't think that at this time that we have anything planned but um we can meet with the uh Time we don't. It's really tu it's really touchy. <laughs> Is this on? Yep. Is this working? Okay. At this time, I don't believe we have anything planned to do that, but we'll meet with the uh, company that performed the development impact assessment and see if they have any recommendations for us to uh, to do that. Yeah. At some point, you will have to address the, this apparent conflict because if the DIA says you should do something, and if Certainly. you're not going to if you're not going to do something, you need to let uh, administration know of, of why. Certainly, I think generally it's the guide wires when we build the big 110 meter guide towers that are the problem. So we'll meet with them and see if they have any um, suggested uh, uh, mediation that we can perform. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I was just hoping, <laughs> as counselor, I took quite a few, Terry, your mic's on and I'm getting feedback. Sorry, they're very touchy. Um, as counselor, I got quite a few emails myself that of course I then referred them on to um, the website or link that you had provided. Um, the biggest question that I got was in the, the styling of it and why it wasn't the tree like in Canmore. So if you could speak to that so that I could have clarity when they ask me later. Certainly. We've, we've actually had quite a bit of troubles with the tree. Um, the needles have, given the massive temperature swings, the needles that they've got on those trees have had a real hard time staying on, so we've been out cleaning those up quite a bit. Um, the trees have been a real issue. Uh, Kenmore's are our, our only one at this time, and uh, so we're, we're still figuring out how to do it best, and uh, at this time, yeah, we didn't feel uh, it was appropriate in this instance. Thank you. I would have had no idea. Um, my second question for someone who has no idea, why do you not have to have aer aeronautical lights on there? Um, NAP Canada and Transport Canada just take it as a, on a per case basis. If there's any um, basically aerodromes in the area, they look at that primarily to see if uh, there would be any impacts. And at this for this case, they didn't think there would be any impacts. Um, after you changed the design to the monopole design, did you receive any further feedback from the public, and in particular from the 41 respondents that uh, had contacted you? Or? We did receive ongoing feedback. Um, unfortunately, not all stakeholders were completely satisfied. And in fact, uh, um, concerns with respect to property value and health and safety did remain. However, the feedback with respect to the visual impact did decrease 
there were some stakeholders who were still concerned about the visual impact of it. Thank you. Um, and I, I can't help but notice that TELUS, of course, is doing a lot of fiber, fiber installations in rural areas. Um, how will that tie together with uh, this particular proposal? Um, so fiber will be, generally if we don't have fiber in an area, we'll use a microwave to bring backhaul into the tower. So since there's fiber there, we don't need a microwave dish to bring connectivity to the tower itself. And then I believe there's fiber to most of the homes and businesses in Dead Man's Flats. So this will be purely, the tower will be purely to serve the cellular customer. Okay, if, if that is the case, then how much of the reason disappears for installation of um, this kind right now for wireless services? So to, to provide further, uh, further detail through the chair, um, the, the fiber provides connectivity to physical structures. Uh, the mobile communications tower provides connectivity to mobile devices which aren't hardwired or connected to fiber. Um, additionally, as my colleague indicated, the existence of fiber provides for the ability for TELUS to connect that tower to the other telephone or to the broader telephone network without using a microwave dish. So that eliminates one piece of equipment that you'll see quite frequently on rural mobile communications towers, and that's the microwave dish. That's not required on this particular structure. So it does reduce the amount of equipment that needs to be mounted on that structure. Um, but the tower, again, provides connectivity to wireless devices, whereas fiber within the community provides connectivity to wired devices. Yeah. Thank you. On, on the map that you showed, where, where you displayed moments in the area of coverage, um, of course, you were quite zoomed in to Dead Man's Flat. Um, if you had zoomed out somewhat more to 10 times the area or something like that, what would it show? Um, so, hi. Okay, so our, uh, we, we, our existing towers in the area, we have one um, next to Stewart Creek as you go into Canmore, and then another one actually just on the Lafarge uh, smokestack here. Um, and then, so those kind of offset the coverage, and that's just the gap in between. It should be fairly seamless now between, uh, once this tower is up and operational, between Canmore uh, all the way, all the way through. You mentioned that uh, you're meeting the health and safety requirements of the Canmore Regulatory Body, but that it holds that. Any idea how recently those guidelines have been updated? Because technology is advancing so quickly, and I assume this is all 5G, and I haven't seen a lot of studies yet on the impact of the electromagnetic radiation created by the 5G compared to 4G. Has, yeah, has this K body upgraded their standards? Or are we still working on the old standards? Through the chair. The uh, Health Canada reviews exposure guidelines on a regular and ongoing basis. None of the equipment that's installed on a facility is ever grandfathered in place. It always must meet the highest test standard in the event that the guidelines are changed for any reason in response to any study today or in the future, the equipment must be modified to meet the highest and strictest standard of the day. So you can rest assured that any studies that are completed, that the equipment will meet those studies. At this point in time, so uh, to, to answer the question, there are currently studies that are ongoing with respect to 5G exposure, and any guidelines that are issued by ISED or by Health Canada will be adhered to by the developer. Thank you. Is this tower replacing the one that we approved at GAP a number of years back? I assume it is. Thank you for the question. And through the chair, this tower does replace the tower that was approved previously. 
Um, the tower that was approved previously, in fact, did not provide the coverage objectives that this tower covers. Uh, the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats would not have been suitably served due to line of sight issues from that other tower. And it was mentioned that if sometime in the future this site becomes unnecessary, that it has to be removed. Is there some kind of bond in place for the removal? The reason I ask that is we've got all kinds of gas wells around the province where the company, even though some of them were huge companies, just walked away from, and now the public is going to pay for the mess. Uh, I just don't want the same possibility in telecommunications. Yes, our, uh, our lease with uh, Oscar Holdings, um, it, once that ends, we have to remove the tower. So unless uh, we'll continue to keep that as the tower is required, but if, uh, if it is no longer required, we'd remove the tower. Yeah, but I guess more to the point, my question is, is there a bond or some guarantee that if a tower changes their mind, that the money is still there to clean it up? Is there any process like that in existence? Because I think you understand what the oil and gas situation is in this province, and I just don't want that possibility there. I can, we we uh, regularly decommission towers, um, uh, so we don't leave them just standing there. We've always gone back and uh, decommissioned towers when they're no longer being in use. Okay, thank you. Just one last thing, if you don't mind, just curiosity. Uh, you talked about emergency services. When you install these new towers, do you put uh, standby, standby power or emergency power in there? There will be uh, battery backup in the Got shelters. It. There's eight hours worth of uh, battery backup in, okay. in all of our shelters, yeah. Are there any standards around that? Um, uh, to be completely honest with you, I don't know if it's uh, industry standard or if it's just a TELUS, uh, TELUS mm -hmm. standard. So I'm, I'm actually not too sure. I can get back to you on that. Oh, no, that's fine. Just, just, just curious. Thank you. I'm just looking for a date on this. I think it's the, for the most, a recent comment on the TIA from Karen. I don't even see the company name. Yeah, Karen Oldershaw, who reviewed the DIA, and I think I got the most recent report from her, and it's mentioning uh, that the economic and social impacts of a part of the DIA really wasn't adequately covered. That's what I'm understanding from what she wrote. And she also mentions about the uh, uh, the potential for site contamination from previous land use was apparently not carefully investigated and also mentioned air attractants that might be an issue. Uh, Kevin, I think it was addressed in that revision dated October 13th. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. because there was enough a paper shuffle here. I wasn't sure if it's yeah. going to be addressed. Okay, it's been answered. Thank you. Any other discussion? I'd like to uh, see uh, Kevin's uh, um, concern with regards to uh, the uh, decommissioning of the of the tower, potential decommissioning that that be included as one of the uh, conditions. So that it's on record with us rather than just being between you and the landowners. Okay. Go ahead, Alice. Um, in regards to the um, visual um, concerns of the tower. Are, were the concerns aesthetic or were they that they were, it, the tower was 
blocking or interrupting you? Through the chair, uh, generally speaking, the concerns were aesthetic. And the previous design being the lattice style structure uh, with the antennas that extended away from the structure, uh, it was viewed as having too much impact on the view shed. And so the slim or the monopole design with flush mounted antennas is designed to minimize the footprint of the structure itself and the and the impact on the view shed. And really it's it's um, it's as tidy a, a structure as, as you can install for this purpose. Thank you. Any other discussion? I will make the motion that we approve staff recommendation. Do you want me to read it out? No. Okay, you're good. Um, so a motion to approve staff rec. All in favor? Carried. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, perhaps uh, just before we go on to the next one, it, um, you sent us last night uh, that revised document and. Part of that was this report from October 13th, but I don't think that's in the package you had left with us today. So can we make sure that that's in the in the agenda then? Okay, let's go to uh, E2. Hello, Johnson. Oh, there you are. Perfect. Hey. Morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee members. My name is Johnson Kwan. I'm a senior planner with WSP and presenting item E2 on behalf of administrations. Morning, Johnson. Go ahead uh, when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Stephen Permit Amendments request was submitted by CTV Dell Media for the additions of an energy generation system small including a solar collector located at Southeast Section 18, Township 25, Range 10, west of the 5th Meridians, approximately 250 meter north of Harvey Height. The original application was approved by the Municipal, uh, Municipal Planning Commissions on August 17, 2022, and was issued on September 21st, 2022 with fellow appeals. The original approval allows two energy generation systems small, including wind energy conservation systems and solar collectors with setback relaxations. On October 12, 2022, the applicant requests amendments to the original approved development permit due to supply issues and increased ancillary costs to the project. The proposed amendment now consists of a solar collector uh, system only and removes the originally approved wind energy conver conversion systems. However, the proposed solar collections uh, comprise a larger footprint and requires further setback relaxations. For this reason, the amendment request is being presented to the planning commissions for considerations. The proposed solar collection system is approximately 3.96 meter in height, 3.66 meter wide, and 18.9 meter, uh, meter long. The system will be mounted on screw pile to minimize disturbance to the lens within the lease area. The applicant requests relaxations of the yard setback requirements, including front yard setback from 40 meters to 21.34 meters on the west side, a wear yard setback from 30 meters to 23.16 meters on the east side, and a side yard setback from 30 meters to 8.84 meters on the south side. In accordance with Section 441.3.4 of the Land Use Bylaw, the Municipal Planning Commissions can relax any required yard setbacks to a minimum distance of three meters on a lease crown land, provided that relaxations will not adversely affect the existing or potential future use of lands adjacent to the lease. The applicant has been in communications with the adjacent lease owner to the south, which is also a telecommunication site. The adjacent lease owner indicated they have no objections to this amendment. Given that the surrounding area is mainly forested with low intensity of developments, 
administration conclude that the request amendments and setback relaxations would not adversely affect existing or potential future use of lands adjacent to the subject lease area. As such, administration recommends approval of the development permit amendment with conditions outlined in this report. This concludes my presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Johnson. Any questions? Straightforward. Nothing? I'll move acceptance of staff recommendation. Thank you. So, motion to approve staff recommendation. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Member. Okay, let's move to B3. Thought we would, I thought we'd see the, uh, where is it, put the uh, logging plan together for the city of Kim. Mm, no, I think it's in the Parks and Culture Center. Yeah, see, that is in B3. Oh. That is in, it seems like it Far away. Like it doesn't. Oh, they should. Development permit application number eighty twenty two, logging operation at Silver Flats area, location Southeast Section Ten Township Twenty Five Ring Six, West of Fifty Meridian District Agriculture Conservation District. Proposed development is logging activity. This application is submitted by Darren Dissett. The application the applicant is acting on on behalf of the registered um, property owner, Karen Holmes, who had provided an email authorizing direct to act on our behalf. The reason why this applicant application is being brought before the NPC today is because logging is listed as discretionary uses in the Agriculture Conservation under Section 8.3 of the Land Use Bylaw 09Z18. So the application is regarding this area. So for this application, we did send out a um, referral package, and um, the applicants also submitted um, a best detailing plan. It's included in the package for today. And then um, operations um, provided some recommendations, which were again um, added to the conditions in the development permit. Okay. Um, the applicant submitted evidence of neighbor notification. We did not receive um, any um, any comments, but there was um, a call regarding um, them inquiring about that, which we have um, attended to. The harvest plan is um, included in this package. Staff recommendation is that NPC approve the development permit. 8022 for logging activity in Southeast 10 Times 5 with Meridian Park, subject to the listed conditions. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Ashley. Um, any questions? Okay, I looked through the plan a couple of times. I didn't read it in detail, so just I know not to embarrass it, but I was looking for to see what authority approved the plan. And is my assumption correct that the stamp on page 122, page 5 of that document, is some government authority that looked over the plan after it was submitted? So the, the applicant, the I had um, the forester, that would prepare the application, and the forester would have to go to certain um, agencies to make sure that they do have approval. So all of those have been addressed, and then once um, if um, the application is approved, then um, once the process is completed, the applicant would have to inform us that everything is completed for us to properly close the deal with that applicant. So, but um, all the necessary agencies have been um, informed and um, coded in the harvest plan. So somebody with proper authority approves it before it actually begins. I don't know if I would say approve 
what um, the harvester did is to make sure that the procedure that they would, or um, the way that the um, logging activity will be done is uh, in compliance with all the necessary regulations. Okay, that's what I was asking. Mm, yeah, because I was looking for that immediately, and the only thing I could find was the stamp on page 122, which I assumed was what was necessary. Okay, the other thing you mentioned in your introduction that operations department had looked at it, but I, I couldn't find any place where you reported their comments. So the comment has been added to the, um, to the conditions. And one of the, um, the recommendation is about the overweight or dimensional permit so that the um, vehicles and loads, so it's been added there. And then a road use agreement as well, it's been added there. And then there is um, a portion that talked about if, um, I'll just read it out. Council approval of the road agreements work for all consisting of more than 100 single directional overweight or over dimension trips in a 30 day period. So that will be the recommendation from uh, from uh, operations. I, I don't know if I can say this, but I don't mean to say that there is a lot in the, in the land use bylaw that um, some people would not even look at We actually went to a very lengthy discussion for them to be able to submit this application. Terrific. Okay, we've, thank you. We've seen quite a few of these, or half a dozen or so anyway, over the last couple of years. Um, it's interesting to see what's happening in, in the bylaw. Is, um, they can actually do harvest no more than 20, more than 20 tons. I don't quite understand. How oh, do you enforce that? I, I, there's that, I, whatever that 10% number. Yeah, it gives you, I think the intent of that was to let landowners be able to clear building sites because anything that, I mean, when you take, keep trees down, it's considered to be logging. Just to follow up on Kevin's uh, comment, uh, I know there's there's an effort to make the packages not so thick, um, but we do usually like to see the responses from from the departments, so from operations or the ag field management or whatever. So we appreciate those being part of the package. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just a question regarding um, that we didn't get any feedback from any neighbors. Um, I'm looking at the map on 143. I don't know the area nearly as well as some others in the MD. Um, how, what sort of radius would have been sent out to neighbors? My apologies. Um, are there lots of homes in the area that would have been impacted or is it like three individuals along that road? Do we know how many people will be directly affected? I don't have the actual number, but um, I remember like going back and forth with them to make sure that that is actually taken care of. And then um, when we did uh, receive that phone call, I was able to let that know. Okay, my, my concern was mostly about normally when we've got something, we you know send it out within a radius, but I was worried that we might not be catching everyone who would be impacting if we just went with a circle radius when it's someone along a road that might be impacted. Yeah, I think the, um, I think the rule is adjacent. So typically, like in a hamlet, we'll see families directly around. Um, so that's the other thing, Hassett, is it, it's, it's um, 
valuable for us to see. Usually there's a, a map and on there um, with marks on uh, which properties were given notification. That would be helpful. Thank you. Peter, did you have something? Thank you. I was I was going to take the fall because I didn't get back to the communication from the department but if you want to come back and talk about that I'd be happy to talk about that as well yeah I appreciate that I think uh, it is useful for us to, to see those any other any other discussion yeah um, page 139 I'm looking at that and if um, if I look at it correctly it's I guess the areas within the white that they would like to uh, to cut. Um, I didn't read the package closely enough to uh, understand what the reasoning was for the clear cut and just none of our business. Um, but uh, did the staff have any understanding as to whether this is uh, simple to to market the piece as a revenue come down to the but that of course would clearly have an impact on the properties well i spoke with kevin and then we started a you know the circular seven part of the um the site to the split room for Ease of movement, and then she said um, some of the kids were kind of interested or something, and she was actually gonna burn the trees. And then I, I went, uh, I was like, no, you can't be doing that. <laughs> there are processes that then um, it took us um, a while to be able to get them to apply. And for this application, I've actually been in now uh, discussion with them since August, I believe. They've been going back and forth before we eventually went through with the application. They submitted the application to the Ghana Redraw again, and here we are. So if if the trees indeed were diseased, shouldn't there have been a study indicating that? There's there's reference in the in the package to that. They, they do, a, a, just just from personal knowledge, they do a big inventory of everything that's in there before they start in order to give the landowner an indication of how much how much is left under the rake. And um, they, there's, a, there's a table of contents in there for study. Peter? Um, thank you. I have been um, educating myself to get advice and get counsel and just looking at this it is consistent with what is considered best practice in the state of the forest is this is a for this is a fire based forage method system um, according to the spray lake sawmill and to trees that are 15 years old or older it is it is it is too old for this so we see fall and spring um, and the uh, the tree contact coverage forest coverage is going to be determined by the tree coverage. So um, her her approach of taking patches by patches and leaving certain tree islands behind and meeting the goals that she marks in her little spray bubble in that corner is, is consistent in my opinion with best practices in the state of the forest climate. And I have been educating myself through various sources so that I can in this matter. Any other discussion? Kevin? I just wanted to comment that uh, the group has baptized the reservoir and the tree and the portion of the pine tree that's in this piece. So yeah, I'm not aware of any study that went on beforehand that spoke of the, the number of trees in the forest plan. So 
recognize and and honor you for all you've done in our souls. Uh, We don't want to come back to you in any other way than we did when we came in. Thank you. That's that's something that I think we should be aware of. Um, I was had a brief tenure at Pepsco where we spent some time describing the evil infestation of Mother Russian Major League Trees. Um, I worked at Park County for a very brief afternoon in Reed. It was approximately 2% evil kill. I was driving down the Ellsworth Parkway at that time, just having seen the Ellsworth Parkway, and suddenly I started to think gas for an entire city of 35 or 50, just, just eyeballing it, between 35 and 55% evil kill which basically means that the park is no longer the timber, is a timber box. Um, and we'll be moving south into Bennett Park, and we're gonna start to restore convincing a lot of the, over the next 10 to 20 years is my guess. Um, the sort of cutting is, is a way of reducing the, the fire risk and the, the beetle spread. It is an endemic species. The way it was described to me in 2008 by the chief uh, forest fire, the chief of forest fighting at Gasper National Park at the time was is that young trees know are able to fight off the beetle infestation uh, through sap, and um, the beetle are are killed at temperatures of minus or the minus 25 and down, usually minus 30 and down temperatures, which are its temperatures have to stay long enough for the actual tree to reach that temperature right throughout, um, which usually takes, depending on the width of the tree, one to three weeks. We don't usually have minus 20 to minus 30 anymore, so the cold kill of the beetle doesn't occur in typical winters anymore, but the, so that leaves the only defense for the tree is the sap production. Or because the spruce species, once they hit 50 years, they just won't generate enough sap anymore to fight off the beetle. Again, I'm not a professional forester. I just have kind of educated myself over the last few years on how to protect the trees. But yeah, I this is the sort of cutting that I think we need to consider and think quite broadly throughout the MD to prevent um, significant Discussion, comments? Or do you have a motion, Kim? Um, so were there, um, so n- the area was um, notified about the, the logging activity, or is discretionary use still in effect? The, there's, from what they said is they, they sent out notifications that they would have to come back. Come back. And um, as far as um, um, logging activity and vehicle um, activity, the um, removal of the trees as far as roads and traffic is concerned, is there any plans to revisit that in the future? Operation Dead Trees has a permit guideline, which is already in the county code. Um, it's not really a concern. It's just measure to take to make sure that they're not going to come back to the property and um, to mitigate the effects from the elderberry infestation. There's no other discussion, could I have a motion? So a move, uh, motion to approve staff recommendation, all in favor? Okay, that's carried, Peter. Mr. Chair, would the MDC have a special administration to deal with this issue of the special use bylaw issue? If Mayor Yes is in charge of that, thank you. I 
guess that, that at least uh, so you know we understand what um, <clears throat> whether there's an issue or not. Okay, so we move to E4. So it's got a it's similar ap application. I would uh, quickly just read the location. Actually, I don't know if you would want me to go through the things in the system recommendation that we received from operation. Let's just a, let's just ask. Uh, it is very similar. Is, is, is everybody comfortable with with the package the way it is? I mean, it's almost the same as the previous one. I think we're good, half set. So mm -hmm. just one question, um, same, same thing you had, no, we had no response to the uh, neighbor notification? So any other discussion? If not, any motion? Yeah, I'll move acceptance of staff recommendation. Okay, motion to approve staff rec, all in favor? That's carried. So we go to E5. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is development permit application number 8722. It was submitted by Mac Fans and Furnaces, which is owned by Mark and Rick uh, Cousignon. The landowner of the property is Curtis Cook. Um, the reason that this application is before MPC is because it's a discretionary use in the Hamlet Industrial um, District for manufacturing and distribution. Uh, so the applicant is um, operating a uh, light sheet metal fabrication um, operation in indoor storage within an industrial bay in Denman's Flats. So the landowner, Curtis Cook, gave authorization for Mac Fans to apply for a development permit. Um, so the subject property is located within the hamlet of Denman's Flats at 208 number one Limestone Valley Road. There's a location map in uh, your agenda package. So the manufacturing and distribution operation um, is approximately 100 um, meters squared uh, for the floor area. Um, so there's a floor plan attached. Um, so there's going to be a storage area, a washroom, and an open space, which will be utilized as part of the light fabrication for um, sheet metal. Um, I did receive confirmation from the applicant that they will be making a barrier-free washroom. Um, so there's a written description within the agenda package for their day-to-day -day operations. Um, in the land use bylaw, um, based on the square footage of the bay, they will be required to have two parking stalls and one loading um, stall at the bay. The way how this um, building was approved was the loading was with inside the bay. Um, so they've been issued two parking stalls out front. Um, so there's a condition stating that um, they need to always know who's parked in the first um, parking stall so that they always have access to the loading bay. Um, there'll be a maximum of two employees at the site. Um, which would also correspond with the two parking stalls out front. Um, notification was provided to the adjacent unit landowner, um, and there were no there was no response received. Um, there is staff recommendation to approve with the subject conditions listed below. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. Uh, questions or discussion? Uh, just one question, Katie. Uh, Often, we've seen um, requests for like lun lunchroom facilities, and I wondered if you'd had that discussion with them. Uh, no, they didn't mention that they were going to have a lunchroom area in the in the bay. They were primarily needing it for storage of their equipment, and right. then just doing the light fabrication um, at the site, and then taking it to uh, wherever they're going to do their installations. I'm guessing the difference is that um, these guys are not in there full time. They come in and do some That's stuff. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Any other? 
Not, uh, do you have a motion? I would like to make a motion for staff recommendation. So motion to approve staff recommendation. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Okay, we've got a number of um, applications approved by the development officer. Any, uh, any discussion on those? If not, we'll accept those for information. And we have no subdivision applications, no lease referrals, no new business, nothing to go on camera. Um, usually there's uh, council minutes. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, so we weren't including them in the agenda package. They're posted on the website, um, but we would just need direction if we're going to be including them in agenda packages or not. I would like them to be on the agenda. I mean, they're available. It's usually in the past, um, we've had a copy of all the plans and everything for um, meeting minutes, um, and I, I, I find them because of things on the agenda that I don't think are very good. Um, but they are available on the website. I would encourage you to look at that as well if you have not already. So any comments? Pretty good idea. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so next meeting, December 21st. Which I'm assuming is that date because the last Wednesday you won't be here. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, and just to clarify, are we including the council meeting minutes or no? No. no? Okay. Thank you. I think those might be useful on either email to be sent out indicating what those minutes were. I can. I can do that for sure. Yeah. So I think we're done. We have a motion to adjourn. Move adjournment. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Thank you. And we're adjourned. Thank you.